typically, when you're ready to hear a uh, group of people hold forth on a, a topic like Python 3, uh, the first thing you want to do is to know whether they are at all qualified. And so, um, if we could have each of you just briefly, uh, we'd like to know how long you've been involved or, or touching Python 3, uh, whether you've deployed it or not, and um, y y how long your experience has been with it. And we can start over here. Hi. Uh, I started to work with Python 3 since the beginning, before Python 3 existed, because I, I, I am a Python core developer, and I help to fix all this Unicode issues. So currently, I'm porting OpenStack to Python 3, and I can say that uh, it is in progress, and we have more and more Python 3 libraries uh, which are Python 3 compatible. But in fact, it's not used in production, since uh, it's not done yet. So I am trying to do all my best to port all uh, libraries and dependencies to Python 3, but uh, I'm still using Python 2. Uh, uh, so like Victor, I'm a Python core developer uh, and have been part of the effort uh, for Python 3 since the beginning, uh, as well as being part of the effort to fix all the latent Unicode defects in the Python standard library that were revealed by the transition to Python 3. Um, and, uh, and then I also work for Red Hat, and we're the ones responsible for the fact that people still run Python 2.3 in production. <laughs> um, so I'm all too well aware of the issues associated with long-term maintenance of Python 2 projects. Um, and yeah, and similarly uh, helping with uh, getting uh, Red Hat systems to the point where we can use Python 3 in production. So. Hi, I'm Alex. Uh, I first remember hearing about Python 3 during, I want to say Guido's keynote at PyCon 2008. So it's like six years ago. Since then, I've been involved in the porting to Python 3 process for Django, OpenStack, PyPy, and a whole host of smaller projects. Hi, I'm Selena, and um, for the past two years, I've been teaching uh, PyLadies workshops in Portland. And most of my experience with Python 3 is when pilates accidentally install it. And then... <laughs> um, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> All right, so uh, as the other folks here, I'm also a core developer of the, uh, Python, uh, the, Park, the C Python uh, interpreters. Um, I was involved with the, uh, the initial effort for Python 3 very, like, in around 2007 when we were actually like, designing a language implementing. I, got, I started getting involved using the, the Google Summer of Code, which actually led me to actually, uh, later on, actually to get a job at Google and uh, at Google actually do uh, a lot of Python. And actually, like, it's very difficult for us because we have a, a huge, enormous code base where we're unable to actually port because it's, it's million, millions of lines of Python. And we're actually, I'm actually investigating, like, what, what can we do for, for like, moving on uh, to, the, to the next version? And so the, the panel is, is fairly evenly split between those who, who so to speak, suffer Python 3 and, and those whose fault it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, Alex, you're involved in the PyPy project. I can't remember what its status with respect to Python 3 is because, of course, uh, its initial out-the-door implementation of the, the very, very fast, um, uh, uh, just-in-time compiled version of, of Python, initially targeted to 7? Yeah, our current release targets 2.7. Did it start with 2.7 or 2.6? Uh, we've been evolving the same code base since at least 2.2, maybe older. What is the status of Python 3? So we have a Python 3 branch. It is very, very close to being ready for release. There's an alpha available. And at the sprints, people have been working on the 3.3 branch, so sort of getting going on the next version. Our current Python 3 branch targets 3.2. The um, uh, Guido, in his uh, keynote, if I recall, uh, announced, and, and it, it's, it's now confirmed, that Python 2.7, which has been the, the, the final 2 version uh, now for five years, I believe, uh, has been given another five years of, of maintenance uh, beyond the initial five years um, that was promised. I'd like to hear from the panelists on uh, whether the next five years are likely to be different than the first few, 
or uh, or whether it's likely that there'll be uh, yet another. Uh, what will this be like in a sort of communism? Further five-year plans, because I have clients. I, I, I teach Python professionally at times in corporations, and there are people, I don't know how they do this, but they, they wind up with like a million line Python projects, and they kind of are afraid of Python going out from under them and not being supported anymore, Python 2 going out from under them, because there's just no good time, their bosses think, to, s to stop everything and port a million lines to three, fearing that they fearing that they might send something then out the door, thinking they've transitioned to Python 3, not knowing that there's edge cases that only their customers will find in their Unicode handling or whatever. Um, yeah, and, and so definitely the original way of porting to Python 3 that uh, Guido and the rest of the core developers that we promoted when 3.0 was first released um, essentially doesn't work. Uh, so that was the Big Bang approach you pick a day, you say, we're going to go Python 3 now and we'll switch everything over. Um, turned out that's just a bad idea. You, it's just a terrible way to do it. Um, and so over the past five years, the community have basically figured out a whole bunch of ways to do ports uh, that are instead incremental and opportunistic. That you take parts of your code base and you incrementally upgrade them to be Python 3 compatible parts of the code base. Yeah, and essentially what has turned out to be possible is that even though it was explicitly a non-goal of the Python 3 project um, to make a large common subset of the two languages, uh, as it turned out, we were sufficiently conservative in what we did that there actually is a very large, very usable common subset. Uh, and we've actually been making that common subset bigger by adding stuff to Python 3 releases. Uh, so like Unicode literals came back in 3.3. Um, various things were improved in the codec support in 3.4. Uh, binary interpolation will be coming back in 3.5. Um, and then in addition to that, we'll be adding some stuff into 2.7 around SSL. Uh, and essentially the idea will be that there is a very large common subset of uh, two and three that you can program in. Uh, and then projects like the six project and the future project on PyPI make that common subset larger again. And what that lets you do is program in Python 2, port things to the common subset as you go, but you're still testing and running everything in Python 2. I, so um, if you're testing and running in Python 2, what tool can tell you if your Python 2 is three ready? So this, this is an hitting that subset. Uh, yeah, and so, well, one thing you can do is you can just try running yourself under Python 3 and see if it works. Oh, but if a bunch of your tests uh, are still in 2 and haven't yeah. been ported, you uh, can't do that yet. Uh, the dash 3 warning flag in Python 2 is designed to help a lot with this. Um, at the moment, it is missing some warnings that should be there. Uh, but the thing is, adding new Python 3 warnings is in scope for 2.7 maintenance releases. Mm. Um, so we haven't had a lot of com contributions to add new warnings, but those are in scope. Um, and then the other so there's an opening for Python 2.7 to, to gain more features in the area of helping you identify yes. incompatibilities. Absolutely. Um, the other things, and so getting into the more speculative stuff uh, is... Is this? Oh, okay, that one's better. Um, <laughs> Uh, getting into more speculative stuff, so these are things that are, do not exist yet, but are being discussed. Um, and that is basically, from a syntactic point of view, uh, basically taking something like PyLint or whatever and giving it a mode that says, is this in the common subset? Uh, and make sure you're not using any of the uh, removed constructs. Um, but then another potential possibility, which is even more speculative, but being discussed seriously is um, the idea of a fork of Python 2.7 that doesn't add anything, but just takes away all of the stuff that didn't survive the Python 3 transition. Uh, and then the basic idea then is that you can run your stuff under the fork, and if it runs there, then yeah, you're in the common subset. Um, and yeah, there's a, there, we, that, 
yeah, that one's entirely speculative at this point, but it seems like a good idea. Of the other panelists, um, how many of you have ported anything to Python 3? Just to start with a show of hands. And then, uh, so yeah, could we hear briefly, and in addition to other comments you have on what Nick said, what it was like and what you found the pain points being of getting a project, and, and, and specify whether you were targeting the common subset, that is, whether you're trying to make code that would just work simultaneously on both, or whether you've done anything where you just went for Python 3 that looks like Python 3. So, so yeah, so, so most of my experience has been uh, involved with actually porting stuff within the standard library of, of Python. And one other thing, so so for me, it was actually like targeting the Python three and actually like removing support of Python dot seven, and and even in this case where you actually drop support, it's actually really really difficult because you end up adding all the Unicode issue that you maybe like made assumptions, and 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 these actually kind of they really hit you in the butt and at some point because. Um, like you have to, sometimes you have your APIs actually like, we, we had the issue for example with the file system actually the, the, the API wasn't, wasn't designed to actually have Unicode in it. So, so we had to come up with way and acts to actually kind of like be able to, okay well we, we assume this, this, this kind of like API that was like all ASCII and, and that we can actually convert to characters. But actually we actually didn't know what's the, the encoding so we had to kind of like return like for example, uh, there's a case for example, the, the, the file system paths. And there are cases where if the file system, uh, you don't know the encoding of the file system, there's not really a whole lot you can do. And one of the things, so, so you have to use bytes. And so we had to extend the API to actually support when you give it like a, a, a bytes path, then it will return you a bytes, it won't do any encoding. But still at the same time, one trick we use is if you give it like a, um, one of the Unicode argument, it will actually return you an Unicode. They won't do to try to do the best thing to actually try to convert it. And, and sometimes like, the best thing you can do is just use ASCII and most often uh, on many file systems it will actually kind of blow up. And so that, that was like one of the issues that, and, that we faced. And, and for audience members who might never have tried this before or, or, or have run into this, so if, if I understand the, the problems that under Python 2, if you did something text-ish, uh, and, and had some Unicode strings with international characters that were full strings, but also just kind of tossed some old-fashioned ASCII byte strings at it, Python 2 would, 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 would guess. Mm -hmm. It would just make a kind of best effort attempt, maybe using the encoding you wanted, maybe not, to, to <laughs> interpret the little byte string you had given it. Well, you say probably not. It, but the issue is that very often people test their stuff with all ASCII strings, and so it looks like it's doing what they want, and if nobody ever types those French characters into their web interface, the web app just always works. And that, that guess that Python is making about how what these bytes mean just works so often <laughs> that it's, it's later even in the standard library of Python 3.4, it's later that you run into these cases where that leaping, flying guess that Python was making suddenly doesn't work for a particular circumstance. So uh, let, yeah, let him finish that up. So, 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 so actually, like one, one thing I've been doing, so my first language is French, actually, I'm from Montreal, and one thing I've been doing, and whenever I actually had tests in Python, I actually used French strings. I put like, <laughs> like, like, like extend it, and I put like, actually I used the streets of Montreal as, as, as some of the, my test case. So it's kind of my little, like, I'm putting my little pause and, and my pad into the standard library, it's kind of a lot of fun. And one thing actually had a lot of like a lot of trouble uh, apart from Unicode is actually we reorganized the standard library in Python three. That that was actually a, like a re that actually turns out like, actually as Nick said is like a huge mistake. And one of the and actually uh, one of, a lot of the thing actually come on to me because I, I end up uh, I'm actually the, the maintainer of Pickle. And Pickle actually, if you know about how Pickle works, it takes your class and it dumps like the, the full the full path of the module and the object that you have, and, and a lot of the, the dependency that you had like in your class they actually end up being dumped into disk. And when you try to actually come and load these Pickle in Python three, then you're like, where like where these class actually all come from? They're just like, hey, I'm trying to import like I don't know like C string, like C string is gone Python three. So where where is it now? It's like, what do you do? So in Pickle, I had to actually like map all 
all, uh, it created a huge map of all the change we did, so, and like put so, them so that you could load up Python two pickles exactly. So, in so actually, Python three actually because one of the contract in pickle is that like every version of, of Python should be able to load like every four version of Python should be able to load like pickles generated by a previous version of Python. And and that promise when it was made was just about if we tweak the format, we <laughs> promise to read the old one too. Exactly. So so not if we rename the whole standard library, <laughs> so, we're gonna so, magically <laughs> translate. So so as you can imagine <laughs> as you can imagine I had a lot of fun during a summer. It took me a whole summer actually like going through and finding all the small tests could I spent a whole summer trying to have a whole lot of fun, like trying to map it too. And it's actually not fully fixed. Uh, actually, like on the sprints, if someone actually want to go and, and fix some more, uh, uh, more of these pickle like incompatibility in Python three, more than welcome. Like come and see me on the uh, sprints. I'll, I'll have like a lot of fun, like trying to teach you how, how crazy this idea was. Does that mean the pickle module is going to have a dictionary in it that maps old to new names and that? It already does actually. So, so it's, it's actually a secret module internally that's called uh, underscore compatible pickle. Well, that's not going to stop me. <laughs> probably. <laughs> so, so we probably should consider actually mapping it and, and giving an API. So, so the crazy thing is try, try, try to, to map this thing is like pickle was not designed like very well and, and, and we, we kind of took this big hit in Python 3 and it was a lot of fun. So, uh, On the way past Selena, because it, when, when we were talking about training a minute ago, uh, it, made me, it made me think of the question. So the student goes to um, python.org. They've been trained to always download the most recent version of anything because SSL, and <laughs> which actually applies in this case. Um, and they wind up with, with Python 3, and you helpfully uh, downgrade them to um, the, the happy and safe world of 2008 or nine. How do they then react to the fact that you want them on like this older version? Do they do they do they kind of go through the class and then never come back because they're like, this is weird. The Ruby people want me to use the most recent version, but the Python people are like all sitting in the trenches. Their leaders have like ridden out to the front by themselves. <laughs> Let's talk about Perl 6 for a minute. Just kidding. <laughs> it's really confusing to the students. They really don't understand why we're downgrading them, and they feel like maybe one of the things that they think that people have told me is that the PyLadies classes are just crap because we're only teaching them old crap that no one uses. <laughs> and then I explained the 2-4 situation with Red Hat, and also that my project, my open source project that I work on at Mozilla is still 2.6, and then they feel a little bit better that at least 2.7 is better than 2.6. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> but yeah, it is, it is that part is very confusing. I will say that the new python.org website design improves the situation significantly because instead, I don't know if you all know this, but the Python download page used to be organized alphabetically by topic. And so you would go to the download page and the first thing that you would see is alternative implementations of Python. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah, I have a screenshot. It's really great. It's on my laptop. <laughs> anyway, this is one of the examples of design failure for beginners that I share. Uh, but now the website is is way, way better. Um, but another improvement that I would suggest is not linking to a wiki page to explain the difference between 2.6 and 3, or 2. Dot whatever and 3. Dot whatever. Anyway, um, although that may have been fixed by now. I don't know. No. no. OK. Well, suggested improvement. Um. <laughs> uh, so I will point out that while Python.org used to be an arcane thing that people couldn't help with, uh, it is now a Python 3.3 project on GitHub uh, under the Python account, uh, and so yeah, it's and yeah, and it, and it's basically along with the it's kind of part of the whole opening up the PSF thing and making it more accessible. So GitHub repo, uh, open source Python 3.3 Django project. Um, pardon? Pa patches accepted. Uh, yeah, patches accepted. Uh, that particular one should be going in on the CMS side um, because, yeah, it was it was on the wiki because updating the old website was, uh, yeah. <laughs> we actually wanted people to be able to contribute to it, <laughs> which was not true of the old website. Um, okay, sorry. I don't know. I think that was sufficient. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay. I mean, I could talk a little. I mean, another another big barrier I would say to using three dot three dot whatever in a teaching context is that even for something as simple as a Flask app, um, you you can't really use 3.x with the tutorials that exist today. And then if you actually go to the Flask documentation, it says that you know 3.x is only 1% of downloads, so we don't really recommend that you do it anyway. So there's, there's a lot of barriers for kind of the typical libraries that you might teach in a very beginner's class. Um, and you know something that would definitely help PyLadies like workshops would be for the maintainers of the introductory type modules to uh, support three a little more. Alex. Yes. Uh, you were, when we were on the subject of, of experience of porting, porting to Python 3, yeah. If you want a pickle, go to Schwartz's, not the standard lib. <laughs> <laughs> um, so every single module I've ported has been to a shared source using libraries like six. Uh, to tell the audience what six is in case so they've not six seen is it. it, it it's S I X, right? Yes, six, not, like the, the not the digit. Yeah, it's the English Arabic letters for six English Latin letters, uh, the not Latin. the Arabic numeral. Um, it is basically a module to assist you in Python three porting. It provides all sorts of useful helpers. An example of which is if you can't use the Unicode literals because you support Python three point two, which doesn't have them yet. You can just use the U function, which will convert your string to be Unicode on both versions. It has useful helpers, like the long type was removed in Python 3, so now that it, it exposes a thing, six dot uh, integer types, and you can use that if you want to check if something is instance int or long, and it will work across Python 2 or Python 3. All sorts of useful helpers, or, or six dot iter items, will do the equivalent of dict.iterItems on Python 2 or dict.items on Python 3. Useful helpers like that. So we use this completely throughout Django and a bunch of the other libraries I work on. Uh, as for how the experience was, uh, basically the experience completely didn't start until libraries like 6 came out. The Like Nick said, the original, you just do it all at once, it'll be great, uh, approach was a complete non-starter for us. Probably one of the most interesting things I've seen is we'll do the port, we'll get all of our tests running, someone will like do the demo website, like load up the, hey, you install Django page in Python 3, it works, it's awesome. Uh, we shipped an alpha release, then we shipped it, then we, uh, in Django 1.5, in Django 1.6, Python 3 support was official, final, like we're supporting it from here on out, it'll be great, you should use it. And then we find out that you know, there were places in the standard lib or in our own library that were under tested and that just the Python 3 code bath was never exercised in our tests and so we missed cases. So that was really interesting seeing those reports come in, trickle in from users. Um, so, so as a project manager, yeah, as, as a projects always do this, they issue an alpha and ask people to test and issue a beta and ask people to test, not realizing that it's it's issuing the real new version that's the way you ask people to test. Yep. And, that, and that's when people run into the problems. <laughs> oh, we realize it. <laughs> <laughs> um, any other, uh, any particular um, points that are, are so and, and, and Unicode was the main, Unicode and renaming, six handles the renamings as well? Six handles most of the renamings, including the moved standard lib modules by letting you just do from six dot moves import whatever the new name for the thing is. So that's pretty nice. Unicode is definitely the brunt of the thinking work. There's a lot of like small changes. For example, the exception capturing syntax changed, got rid of uh, the function uh, tuple unpacking inside of function arguments, which is an obscure God. feature, but if you I'm use it, kidding. you gotta make a lot of changes to your code base. Things like that you know, ultimately take up a lot of time. I've been lately involved in the Twisted porting efforts, and one of the most striking things there is Twisted is something like a 15-year-old code base, and about 10 years ago they figured out that testing was really important and you should write unit tests, and there's still five years of code older than that that does not have great test coverage. So one of the big issues the Twisted project has is you need to add tests before you can start porting any of these features, because otherwise you will almost certainly break it for all of your existing users, and it probably won't work for your new users either. So that, that's, I would say, 
one of the biggest impediments, at least in the context of older projects that do not have universal test coverage. All right, and could we overhear do, any uh, tales to tell about your uh, porting experiences? So, so far, uh, I keep hearing, in the, 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 given your uh, uh, positions and projects, uh, the experiences we've heard reported on so far are, are libraries that were Python 2 um, being moved to this kind of common subset. There's no standard for it. It's just the, the, the idea of code that will be acceptable to either Python 2's interpreter or 3's. And, and so none of you got, none of the reports you were giving were of code bases where you could just run 2 to 3 on it and, and fix everything and be in Python 3 land. Uh, is, that, is that correct? Uh, most of you guys have been, because you're serving other users that will be on both Pythons, you've been moving to that common subset where you have to swear off of any specifically Python 3 advances. You don't get to have fun with the new stuff in the language because you're remaining uh, compatible. Okay. All right. Well, uh, the first problem with porting to Python 3 is that uh, you have to fix all your bugs in your applications. <laughs> For example, uh, in Python 2, Unicode does just work. It doesn't work in all cases, but it almost works. It pretends to work. <laughs> it pretends to work. So in Python 3, it's, n it's now forbidden. You have to fix it to all places at once. You cannot uh, just switch a, a flag to say that, oh, it doesn't care of Unicode uh, um, characters, just uh, try to do your best. Uh, when you port, you have to fix all issues before being able to run your real application. There is also uh, the opera uh, division operator we changed, S and it's a pain to, to handle this, this minor operator because in Python 2, it's impossible to say that if the result will be a float or an integer. Using tools like uh, 2.3, it's not possible to to do that automatically. So you need a huge, large uh, test suite to ensure that all the port will work on Python 2 or on Python 3. <laughs> and uh, in practice, uh, there, are really, there are very few code base which is tested. And so you are not sure that even if the code looks to work, you will probably get some errors uh, much later. Hmm. So it's a pain. And the other problem with Python 3 is that, uh, in fact, it's not so much faster. It's, no, it's not really amazing if you just port your applications to Python 3. It just works, but that's all. So if you would like to have a better application, you, you have to use new features of Python 3. But you cannot do that because you still, still want to use Python 2. And, um, and because you have to, to support Python 2, in fact, the portage is almost useless. So it's a pain, it's a useless, but you should do, you should do port your application to Python 3. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so this situation reminds me very much of when Postgres changed. It. So I'm a major contributor to the Postgres project, and um, we changed our default encoding from SQL ASCII, which is basically anything goes, <laughs> to UTF-8. And when this happened, um, there's another other change that we did also that uh, restricted the automatic uh, type conversions as well. Um, I think these things came one year after the other. And, and I think this, this didn't apply to existing databases. Or do That's right. Like when you created a new database, so you got a little surprise. Um, <laughs> and and um, uh, I will say, I think it's been five, maybe six years now, and um, users still get caught off guard by it. Um, and in <laughs> fact, there are a couple of packagers that have decided, um, <clears throat> Debian, um, to uh, make the default encoding uh, SQL ASCII um, in their package which is uh, sort of a shocking um, special decision. But um, anyway, uh, I will say that the users were initially upset and confused and angry, <laughs> um, probably for about two years. <laughs> but in the end, it was such a beneficial change, um, you know, in talking about these bugs that you find and these things that you're able to fix, this data corruption that you avoid. 
uh, it really was ultimately the right decision. And in the end, the users supported it, but there were like two years of uh, a lot of very angry users. I, I just got I one more thing. I think Nick had a comment, and we're just at half time, yep. which means that we'll switch over to audience questions. Um, so yeah, so my comment is actually based on something Alex said a while ago, like not here, um, <laughs> which was, uh -oh. <laughs> which was um, when you're writing software, you're either writing for the users you have or you're writing for the users you want. Um, and so for a very long time with Python 2, we were writing for the users we had. The interesting thing that happened with Python 3 was that Python 3 was about writing code for the users we want. Uh, and one of the major contributors to the Python 3 process uh, is uh, Stephen Turnbull, who's uh, XEMAX, uh, I'm not sure if he's the lead or just one of the major contributors. Um, and so, uh, and he lives in Japan. Uh, and so, Japan, if uh, the issues Europeans hit with encoding issues, uh, nothing compared to the issues East Asian countries hit. Um, Who've been known to use non-Latin alphabets. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and so in the days, in the days before Unicode, uh, they had come up with all these solutions like Big Five, CJK codex. Um, they, they just, out of necessity, they came up with all of their own encodings to try and deal with um, uh, to try and deal with uh, representing Asian languages in uh, bytes-oriented computing environments, um, and ASCII compatibility just was not a factor. <laughs> it was and, and, it, and so and so and, this move for Python was so one that had to be made before we would be big in. Yep. Markets that need well, well, Unicode and, and, everywhere, yeah, end and, to end in the language. And, and so this was the thing of that Python two. Uh, if you're uh, if you're a Chinese user and your home directory is na it uses your actual name, Python two won't run. Uh, it, it it won't be able to start because it can't handle the name of your user directory. Um, and, and so and so this was a case of us going well, okay. Uh, we are actually going to listen to the experience of the web developers, the experience of the desktop GUI developers, and that basically in the 21st century, first class, first class Unicode support is not optional. Uh, and so we went and created Python 3, and then we released Python 3.0 and 3.1, and we went, wow, our Unicode handling is really, really broken. Um, and, and uh, Tom Christensen, I think, is a guy who's gone through a lot of the Python 2 Unicode support and just went, yeah, all these things are broken. Um, and so people who've only used Python on Linux systems, so the Linux developers, uh, Linux distros, always build Python 2 with four-character Unicode. Um, and four-character Unicode in Python 2 actually mostly works. Um, the Windows builds were not built with uh, Four character Unicode. They were built with narrow Unicode that only 16, used two bytes. Sixteen bit. That really didn't work. Uh, there was lots and lots of cases where Python two narrow builds would do the wrong thing. Gotcha. Um, and so basically, yeah, what happened was when we created Python three, we then went through and found, oh, okay, uh, this doesn't work in this situation. This doesn't work in that situation. Uh, and there's basically all sorts of Unicode bugs in the Python two standard library that if you're mostly in an ASCII environment, you're just gonna, not going to hit them. Uh, and if you're doing network programming where you're just pushing bytes around and you never actually translate it to text, then you're, you're going to be fine there as well. Um, and, and this is kind of what we see with the feedback, is that the developers who are most struggling with the transition are folks doing network programming where they're taking bits off the wire, pushing them back out on the wire again, and operating entirely in the binary domain. Uh, and then similarly, people who like the Mercurial developers who are again doing file system work at um, that byte level. At that byte level, and essentially what we did in the Python three transition is that we went, okay, the default text model should be optimized for normal application programming, not for the bytes and yeah, bits not people. not for the okay. bytes and networking people. The um. But then what we've been finding over the last five years is that oh, okay, we did make a bunch of mistakes at the binary level and that binary manipulation stuff. Uh, and that's what we're really focusing on 
putting a lot of focus into for 3.5 now is like, okay, we've had five years of doing this. Mm. We figured out where a bunch of the mistakes are. Uh, and, and that, yeah, and that 3.5 mm. will now be about, oh, okay. So this is, this is uh, we, we've, we've now got beyond uh, a lot of the feedback was of the nature of, oh, I liked Python 2 better. <laughs> which we can't do a lot with until we figure out why did they like Python 2 better. Uh, and we think we're finally getting to that point where, okay, we've, we're moving from, oh, I liked Python 2, to, okay, this is a specific issue in Python 3 that, yeah, hmm. it is genuinely not better than Python 2 in these cases. All right. Uh, and we're to, starting uh, to turn it into particular things. So. Cool. The, um, and that's, that's very nice to hear that the networking and binary story, yes? Be careful with the mics. <laughs> oh, don't worry, they only explode but I have a little something to, to add. In fact, uh, we, with this discussion, we, we focused on porting to Python 2 to Python 3. But in fact, if you start a new program with Python 3, it almost just works with Unicode. You don't have to worry about the file system you're encoding. When you can send a URL directly in Unicode, you can uh, write data in Unicode, everything works just fine. So it, it's a little bit surprising because a lot of people are complaining that uh, Python 3 sucks, but uh, a lot of them had b bad experience because of because of porting Python 2 to Python 3. Just just try to write a new program with Python 3 and everything works. Will the Python 3 code work in Python 2? No. 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 <laughs> And so, and this brings us to um, our time. No, 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 this is time for, um, and I believe that we have a first question here. Uh, say it into the mic. Yep. Hi, I'm Matt. I'm a Rubyist. I just went through. <laughs> <laughs> we just went through such a transition with uh, Ruby 1.9 a few years back. Uh, you'll notice it's not semantic version. Anyways. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, you mentioned earlier that um, you have none of the fun if you're building a library and you have to support, support both versions of Python. My question is, as a user, if I use a library that's limited in that way, that supports both, am I going to feel those limits as well? No? Okay. Cool. Maybe. A, a little bit? Okay. Totally, maybe. I, I actually strongly disagree with that. Uh, a great example of that is Python 3.4 contains this new async I.O. module for doing asynchronous networking programming. It relies on a syntax feature that was only added in Python 3.3. If the library you're using for networking stuff still needs to support Python 2, it's quite likely it will make a decision not to expose this feature because it relies on a syntax that it can't even use internally. That's why you can use async I.O. most of it in Python 2 because he backported it. <laughs> Under a different incompatible syntax. Yeah. <laughs> you, cannot, you can't mix them. You, it's only the coroutine bit, so you just have to not use the coroutine bit or only use the coroutine syntax for the version you're using. Most of it is just uh, callbacks, the same as twisted. But if, but if someone who's a library author, just na if someone produces something naively using the yield from syntax that they see in the async IO docs, then the, then it's Python three only. They have to know to use the the special trick. That they they just have to use the callback API the same as yeah. they would with Twisted. What fun! I'm all about callbacks. I love callbacks. <laughs> Did you? Uh, okay, you. I already asked. Mike. Already asked. <laughs> what other users? Yes, my my question is: How has Pyth we Python users? Well, civilians can can <laughs> help you like porting stuff to Python three. Porting uh, help the standard the people developing Python itself or the people who have third party libraries. All of them. Well, we'll just start. Yeah. You can start. Yeah. yeah. And then we'll go I, I this think way. the first thing you can do is actually request from library author to actually actually give you a Python three version to actually just go and say, hey, I, I like to use Python three. Your library is not supported. Please port it and please support me. Because a lot of things what we see is that we have this this kind of problem where uh, it's kind of like the, like 
this like the style kind of heating is stale because we have no way of starting. So the library author says, well, there's no user using Python 3. And so they say, oh, well, there's no user, so we won't port a library. And, and then go, go back and the user is like, well, there's no libraries using Python 3 and supporting Python 3. So you're just like, oh, well. And another thing that you can do is if you do find a library, well, even if you find one that only partially works, uh, if you blog about it, that is super helpful for all of the trainers to be able to see your experience and to know um, whether something is like partially broken, fundamentally broken, or mostly works. That information is super useful from a user perspective for training. Uh, so if you go to pi3readiness.org, it's got a list of the top 360 packages by downloads. Pick one of the ones that's not green and help port it. Uh, the, though I'll note that's not necessarily an easy experience. Some authors don't know what to do if this huge pull request is uh, suddenly dumped on them that... Many small pull requests. <laughs> okay. <laughs> also talk to them first. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that, that was my thought, is that a lot of them... Uh, I'm just thinking of the experiences of, of Jeff Forcier, is that his last name, who, yeah. who, who I think had pull requests to make Paramico, turn Paramico into Python 3 as of a year ago, and as of last month had like five of them. And, uh, and, and it, it, it's, uh, I, it, I'll have to ask him like what it was like to try to get all this smattering of people's ideas of how he might move to Python 3 and then try to get those integrated to a code base that had been moving even as those people had been writing and the, the two didn't intersect very Cause, easily. Because that's the other thing too, is a lot of projects, they do have Python 3 ports in various states of readiness, uh, and it's just not a priority for them at the moment. Uh, and and uh, so like G-Event for I think has had a Python 3 port ready for several months, but their focus was getting to G-Event 1.0, and now for 1.1 they'll try and get the Py 3 port in. So, so yeah, just talk to people first. <laughs> Would there be any chance of a, so we have two to three, is there any chance of there being a 2-2 two, two, um, restricted subset script that instead would There's be already two. So Python Modernize, I believe, still works, uh, even though Arma's not working on it anymore. Uh, and then there's another module called uh, Python Future, uh, and that comes with actually, that actually comes with two scripts. Uh, so it comes with Futurize, which moves Python 2 code forward into the common subset. Into the common uh, subset, doesn't and just break your Python 2 no. abilities. Like no, two it, to three, you Two to three will just break it. We'll just break it, but this uh, one does but, not. So Futurize moves it into the common subset, uh, and then they also provide another script called Pasteurize, which uh, <laughs> goes from Python 3 to the common subset. So. Uh -uh. Did you have a comment? There is a project called 226, which uh, converts your project to you make use uh, of the six module hmm. uh, on your core code, you will still work on Python 2 and Python 3. Are those mentioned? I was going to take it over there next. All right. And she has a mic already? Hi. Uh, yes. Um, so uh, another civilian question. Uh, besides the issue of libraries and porting and incompatibility and so forth, um, if you're a human being and you want to write a Python script and it's not really using any libraries or only Python 3 already acceptable libraries, um, but you still need Python 2 on your machine, of course, for everything else that you do. Um, what is the accepted best practice for moving between Python 2 and Python 3 on your machine? Do you alias Python 3? Do you make virtual M somehow use Python 3 just for whatever script you're writing? Um, do you have recommendations for how people ought to do that? Uh, first question, which operating system? Uh, Unixy, uh, personally Debian. Okay, uh, so most of the Linux distros have a parallel Python 3 stack, uh, so which will be accessible just as Python 3 from the command line. Um, and they, as of last year sometime, most of them should also be shipping a Python 2 alias for Python 2. Even Red Hat. Hey? Even Red Hat. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Red Hat doesn't have a Python 3 stack, so the <laughs> point is moot. <laughs> um, so, um, but then uh, as a, as a cross-platform uh, cross answer that even works on Red Hat and CentOS, uh, the Continue Analytics folks have their uh, Conda, Conda tool for managing 
so whereas virtual env only goes down to the package level, uh, you can't do multiple runtimes, uh, Conda lets you manage the Python runtime as well and do parallel installs. Virtual env also takes a dash p flag when you're making a new virtual env to just change which Python you're using. And there's another tool called a py, py env, I believe, which will just install all sorts of Pythons for you. And Python Z, which will download and compile and install as many versions as you want. He has a mic already. <laughs> Hello? Oh, I was just wondering, uh, you just announced five more years. Do you think you're over the watershed that, like, after five years, you've got enough of the important bits done that you're down to more details? Or is it their fundamental work that's... You can still get a job writing COBOL. <laughs> Thank you, but I'm, a, I'm, not a, I'm not even technically a developer, so... Uh, um, no, 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 his point no. wasn't that you... No, his yeah. point was that 2.7 will be around forever, like COBOL is around yeah. forever. Oh. He wasn't telling you to go oh, away yeah, and get sorry. a COBOL job. <laughs> Thank you. Thank because, you for pointing that out. Because it was a bad question. My sarcasm detector. Yeah, my sar sorry. sorry about that. That didn't come across properly. <laughs> <laughs> what he said. <laughs> Um, yeah, but Python 2.7, uh, it, it's, it's going to be a fact of life for quite some time. Uh, we're, we're basically going to keep working on tools to... Uh, to Because um, uh, honestly, we, when we started the Python 3 project, we didn't realize how fundamental a change the Unicode change was. That, that was kind of something we figured out over five years of fixing Unicode bugs in the standard library. It was like, oh, wow. We didn't realize how broken Unicode was in Python 2, um, uh, despite having people like Stephen telling us it's broken. Um, it's like, un until you experience it, you're just like, oh, okay, yeah, it's bro it was broken. Um, but, uh, but uh, yeah, so, so it's, we'll, we'll keep working on providing more tools to make it easy to get to Python 3, uh, and, uh, and the tools around the common subset uh, the backports on the Python package index. They'll just keep approving and evolving, and we'll, we'll, we'll get there. Frankly, I'm a bit of a skeptic, but who cares what I think? The question is not for us. We've shipped our libraries. We've written a new runtime. The question is to all of you to go back to your companies and the scripts in your uh, bin directory on your local computer and for you to port those and for you to start using Python 3 for real in production and whether you do or do not will determine whether libraries like Django ever become Python 3 only because we can't go there before our users go there. And some of us are working to make sure certain companies are less of a dead weight. <laughs> <laughs> Please. One small comment uh, regarding civilians helping the porting efforts. Uh, the PSF will be happy to support you with beer and pizza if you want to get with your best friends to port a Python package. Uh, you can find all the details on pythonsprints.org. Yes. Yes. Very good point. I know what I'm doing on the weekends from now on. <laughs> Um, I have a like a. Uh, it doesn't it doesn't seem clear to me uh, what like what interest I'd, I would have to port Python three uh, port my code it's to Python one three. Larger yeah. <laughs> beer and pizza, of course. Uh, but effectively, to me, it seems more important now to switch to IPv6 than to port to Python three. Yeah. So, do you have anything to say about that? Um, so, so one of the reasons why, and one of the big reasons why Guido extended the upstream end of life for Python 2.7 uh, is the idea from the core developer point of view has been that end users should, always, should be able to do the Python 3 transition on their timetable rather than ours. Uh, and, uh, and, and so, yeah, and so the extension of the end of life to 2020 was, was specifically about making that really, really explicit that, no, it's not going away next year, it'll... People still have plenty of time. I think you were saying uh, that your users uh, had a good incentive to switch uh, to the new Fosbury code base for some reason. 
uh, what's the incentive for us to switch to Python 3? Oh, okay. That's, that's yeah. How is it any better? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so the thing, the thing from our point of view is, for any given person, the killer feature of Python 3 is going to be different. Uh, so, like uh, the Python 3.3 brought some big, big, big changes to the way Unicode is handled, such which should massively reduce the amount of memory that Unicode applications uses. Uh, so, for some users, that'll be a big deal. Um, Python 3.5 will bring a matrix multiplication operator. So for scientific users, that'll be the case of, well, no, you're not going to want to use Python 2 because it doesn't have an operator for matrix multiplication. Um, and so, so yeah, and so it's the case of, um, and then Python 3.4 has a lot more nice stuff out of the box in it, like async IO, uh, that, um, that for Python 2, you have to go grab it from the Python package index. Or if nobody has backported it yet, take it from the Python 3 standard library, move it, uh, and then um, uh, and then commit it. Uh, Alex mentioned another one, which is the yield from syntax for doing nice coroutines. Um, again, that's a Python 3 only feature. If you're not doing coroutine heavy code, you're not going to care. Um, uh, and you can kind of fake coroutines pretty well with things like twisted inline deferreds and the stuff Victor did in Trollius. Um, uh, tell, can, so, can, does one of you have much experience with, everyone raves on Twitter about this exceptions inside of exceptions thing, oh, Python I, 3. What is, what is, what is that about? That's, oh, yeah. Oh, so I, I think what, what you're referring to is the, the chain exceptions. Yeah, right? what, what are those? So, so one, one of the things that you may actually experience is whenever you actually catch an exception, uh, you you actually kind of like lose the information that you originally had in this exception. When and what happens? So so for example, you, you can assume like, okay, let's say uh, you try to open a file and this file does not exist, and maybe maybe you don't you, you don't want this exception to be raised uh, as an I/O exception. You want maybe to actually you have uh, maybe this this code that's opening a files within a library or, or some 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 module, and actually what you want to instead raise is an application error. So, so I have a try except exactly. around this file operation so that I can do something friendlier when it dies. Exactly. So, so, so instead of what you can do is, so, so, so raise your application error. But, so, so what you have is like what you have a, a try except, uh, like try except IO error, then you would raise uh, application error there, right? So it's kind of a thing that you can do in Python 2. But if you do this, what you end up doing is actually Whenever this error is just being raised, you actually kind of like swallow the IO exception and all the information that was contained in there. Like for example, what was the file that, that you actually didn't open correctly is lost. So th this is actually kind of it can be kind of very annoying for for people trying to debug your your software if, if this application layer is actually kind of like very deep down. And so in, in Python three, we introduce what's what's called chain exceptions. So instead, implicitly, what we would do is like, like what, what you could use before is that you could actually kind of like take the, the whole exception actually and add it into the, the your new exception. But now, now implicitly, what it would do this for you. It will actually take the, the the whole exception, glue it to the new one that you're actually raising, and when you go like on your, your interpreter traceback, it will actually show you the previous exception uh, in 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 the traceback information. And this is great because you don't lose any information. You can actually now use it to debug your your software. Uh, and in terms of myself, so like the main production application I work on is Python two six because rel, um, <laughs> and uh, and the the thing where I most frequently find myself going, I wish I, I wish we were using Python 3, uh, is the classic one where you have a bug in an error handler that you haven't discovered yet um, because your test coverage isn't that good. Um, and then what happens is you get, uh, you get a message in your debug logs or in your error logs saying, um, oh, this formatting failed. Uh, and you're like going, oh, that formatting message is in an error handler and you have no idea what error you were trying to handle. Uh, and so you have to basically fix the formatting bug, push that fix to production, and maybe someday that original error will happen again and you might have some hope of fixing it. Um, and if you were using Python 3 instead, the traceback that showed up in your logs would actually have not only the bug in your error handler, but also the original bug that you were trying to handle. And so in your case, it, th th this is where 
and my error handler code has a problem and dies on me and and, yep. thro and itself throws an exception yes but but that python will whereas you were talking about i can choose to attach the io error to the application here python automatically when when it hits an error and has to kill me it's going to get the exception that was in progress and also have it along for the ride yep okay and and so it means that when you hit the exception traceback logging at the top level, you get all of that info in your trace, in your debug logs. Uh, and you can not only fix the bug in your error handler, but also have some hope of fixing the original problem as well, okay. even if it never happens again. That might or might not have happened to me before. <laughs> I'm not going to admit whether. I see that we have a question over here. We're getting down to the last few minutes, I think, on the clock. How close are we? Just a minute or two, so go ahead and ask your question. So in retrospect, I mean, you guys went through the pains of uh, migrating from two to three, uh, correcting the bugs and so forth. If you were that person that initially saw the, you know, that, that migration from two to three, what would you do different? not move stuff around in the standard library. <laughs> would, would you have done the print statement? Uh, okay, actually, okay, so for the print statement, I have a proof of concept patch on the Python bug tracker that adds call statements to Python. Guido but doesn't- But we don't want them for all statements. We just want them for print. The, the only way you will get them back is to add them for everything because print is not going to get special but case again. We don't again. want consistency. What about those of us who loved the special case? So, for whom print is just a different kind of thing than everything else in Python. Have you ever you, have, have you ever tried to redirect print to a different file like sys.standard? No, that's not what print's for. So, <laughs> Use this one ha, ha, have, have, you ever, have you ever tried to suppress the new line at the end of a print statement? Yes. With the comma? Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do, 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 you, do you know how that actually works? Softbase. No. It sets an attribute on sys.standardout. <laughs> well, or on whatever file. Which or on whatever file you're wants, printing it if, through. If you want to substitute a fake object yeah. for standard out, it always yeah. has to have yeah. that slot. Or, or you could, you know, just use keyword only arguments in Python 3. We, we changed it for a reason. But personally, I'm okay with the idea of adding call statements. So, so You'd Python, have to convince Guido though. Python 3 is supposed to be a lot better and, 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 and Selena might want to throw something in here as well. But, but uh, in my training, so, so, so if I, uh, are we ever going to get rid of the Dunder main thing? I have to explain that every... <laughs> Selena, have you ever explained that to a class? The fact that their module doesn't actually have its real name <sighs> under some circumstances? That's a magnificent noise. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. It's, yeah, it's terrible. I, it, it, I'm the RunPy maintainer. I know how terrible it is. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I, don't, I don't have any... Uh, so my perspective on it is that scripts and modules are different things and you, uh, blending them beyond adding dash M friendly stuff is, yeah, don't do it. Did you have a quick question? We're at time. We have a future module to um, enable future feature of the language in advance uh, in old version of Python or old version where it's not already uh, enabled. Could we have a past module to re enable <laughs> the feature that were in Python 2 in which are virtually impossible to safely port <laughs> two, thousand, uh, two million Scott, like maybe division? So, so, so one, issue, uh, one thing you, you might not see is that a lot of the, the Python 3 features are actually kind of like very, very um, invasive in, in the interpreter itself. So, so actually like supporting these features, it would be like a, a major uh, maintenance burden on, on the, the core developers. And, and at the same time, we don't want, like, we don't want people to actually kind of move away from, from the, the whole style and actually kind of, uh, if, if we would give this, this kind, of, kind of feature, people will start using it and it would be very, very difficult to actually remove it in, from the language. Now, now we need to do like pattern four to actually remove all these past things, which. Um, 
So that actually does remind me of one of the other motives for Python 3. Uh, and so there's the concept of the cognitive burden of a language, that, that if you create a language such that it only ever grows, then it will necessarily become more and more difficult to learn because even if there are old crufty features uh, that new classes say, oh, we'll never use this, when you're doing maintenance programming, you're gonna have to know it uh, because people will use it, there will be old legacy code that uses it, that sort of thing. Um, one of the effective consequences of Python 3 is that uh, even if code is just being updated to run in the modern subset of 2 and 3, uh, you have to remove all those old legacy features. You cannot, you cannot use them anymore because they don't exist in the common subset. Um, and that actually reduces the amount of stuff to learn in order to maintain modern Python 2 code, uh, let alone Python 3. Uh, and this is actually, uh, from my perspective, is that if people learn Python 3 first, then that's actually the modern stuff that survived the transition. Uh, it, uh, it dodges all the legacy behavior. Um, and then at that point, it's just a matter of learning, okay, here's the actual delta that between Python 3 and Python 2. We have um, a second so. or two left, if you so. can uh, condense your last so, comment. Yeah, so, so, so one thing to, to remember, um, we're not totally against adding all feature if they significantly make uh, the, the, the porting actually a lot easier, and this is something that we, when we listen to the developer uh, for Unicode, so we actually had it back the literal, uh, that, that the, the U, kind of the U prefix on, on string, because it was actually kind of like, it, it helped a lot, and the, uh, for, for porting all program, and, and actually kind of increased the common subsets for, for a lot of developers. And um, in this case, the feature was like pretty kind of like trivial, and it was easy to support without actually adding a whole lot of burden on, on, on kind of the language itself. But, but because of that desire for 3 to be simple, we're not likely to see in 3 itself adding back in complexity that's been taken out from 2. The case where we do do that is when the case is made that, that it is an improvement to Python 3 itself. Uh, and so that's what we're seeing with... Uh, in Python 3.5, binary interpolation will be coming back because the case was made that, no, 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 this is something that is that actually makes Python 3 itself better, and it has the added bonus of making port and porting certain kinds of code much easier. All right. So. Thank our panel. <laughs> <laughs>